Welcome to the world's longest undefended border, which at many points is nothing more than a simple wire fence. Okay, thanks to some terrorists, it's defended once again, but this isn't the first time this border's been hot. In 1775, Americans invade and lay siege to Quebec City. In 1812, we fight the War of 1812. 1814, the War of 1812. 1866, the Fenians raid Canada. 1982, the softwood lumber dispute. 1986, 1989, 92, and 96, the softwood lumber dispute. 2004, one diseased mad cow. SARS, 9-11, the softwood lumber dispute. And the hockey strike. I have a theory that we can understand the highlights and low points of the past 250 years by focusing on the high-handed lowlifes who were in charge. As President Truman said, the buck stops here, which is a buck 30 Canadian. As you can see from this official looking chart, the state of relations between prime ministers and presidents closely mirrors the state of relations between Canada and the United States since 1776 American, which is 1867 Canadian. Things get weird at some points, but we can understand the relationship between these two countries by focusing on the gruesome twosomes who ran each country. History bites Uncle Sam. The Prime Ministers and Presidents, the All-Canadians, the All-Americans, the All-Rich White Guys. Neither Canada nor the USA have been led by a visible minority. Someone you can tell is visibly Chinese or Black or Hispanic by their hat but we've both had invisible minorities. For example, you couldn't have told that John Diefenbaker was wacko just by looking at him. Same with Richard Nixon. Another invisible minority? How about anti-Semitics who consult psychics, talk to their dog, and save prostitutes? Canada head, Mackenzie King. America head. Okay, so there were some differences. By the way, bear in mind, history is not a collection of facts. Almost everything is up for debate. I mean, you get a hundred history teachers together and you ask, who thinks John A. Macdonald was our greatest prime minister? Uh, yeah! Yeah! And who thinks it was Mackenzie King? Yeah! And who thinks it was Pierre Elliott Trudeau? Yeah! Yeah! And who thinks it was Brian Mulroney? Uh, how about Jean Chrétien? Uh, Kim Campbell? Mackenzie Bowell? There's always one bowel guy. Canadian-American relations actually began in the 1700s, before there was a Canada or USA. Colonists like General George Washington share many complaints with ordinary Canadians. We want life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Don't we already have that? We want it in writing. We want law, order, and good government. Huh? We want an elected government responsible to the people. We want our elected government to actually govern. We want relief from crippling taxes. <laughs> we would not mind that either. <laughs> Equal rights for all land-owning white men. Yeah, hey, hey, us too. And the right to keep slaves. Yeah, uh, well, uh, come on, I don't know. We want freedom from the tyranny of King George. Huh? Okay, but hey, don't forget respect for the French language and French culture. What? While all of the colonies have complaints about British rule, it's the Americans who act first. The American Revolution. I have not yet begun to fight. Okay, okay, now I have. Give me liberty or give me death. Ow! The American Revolution brings us our first dynamic duo. British Governor Carlton versus American General Montgomery. Montgomery invades, confident of victory. Canadians will welcome my troops as we free Canada from British tyranny. Governor Carlton is equally deluded. If the Yankees invade, 18,000 French Canadians will rise up to support my troops in the fight against the invaders. Right, mes amis? Yes, yes, I don't know. Fight with the British? No, merci, but I will sell food and supplies to the British and the Americans. Eh? Very well, give my men $500 worth of bread. American currency? Hey, this is not real money! So, where do you want to go for lunch? Uh, let's go to the pub. Okay, okay. Imagine agreeing on a new country. A lot of these new Americans still love Mother Britain, 
there's divided loyalties, like our next odd couple, a general who works for the British and a general who works for the Americans. I owe a debt to this new country. I will serve her faithfully. I owe a lot of debt across the country, and I've been served with papers. I have given my leg in battle for these great United States. I gave up my leg in battle for those ungrateful states. I served at West Point, where I pledged my allegiance. I pledged to serve up West Point to the British. I will fight and pound the British until they are gone. I will fight for British pounds until my debts are gone. For freedom from tyranny. For financial freedom. Benedict Arnold isn't alone in switching sides. Meet the United Empire Loyalists. It's the biggest influx of Yankees until the CFL starts drafting Americans. They settle in New Brunswick and Nova Scotia, where the locals offer them a hand. Or sometimes, just a finger. The War of Independence ends with independence and a new people who call themselves the Americans, thereby ticking off everybody else in North and South America. I mean, really, would the Italians go around calling themselves the Europeans? The Germans might. Well, sure, no. A generation after the War of Independence, the old country and the new country were at it again, the War of 1812. America invades Britain. Well, they can't, so they invade British territory, Canada. And here, Fort York, which was once on the shores of Lake Ontario, is a key bastion in repelling the American invaders. During the War of 1812, the Americans tried to capture this fort. Twice! And both times, they were successful. We tend to forget stuff like that. But we do remember that when they tried for the third time in 1814, we drove them off. And all proud Canadians remember that we burned the White House. Well, we didn't. British troops did, but it was on our behalf. At ease. The best way to understand the conflict is to compare two leaders, General Isaac Brock and President James Madison. In this corner, in the red uniform, General Isaac Brock, brilliant tactician, courageous leader, relentless opponent. And in this corner, in black, President James Madison, served in the Continental Congress, father of the Constitution, Secretary of War, and a small wrinkled man with a really stacked wife. Okay, I'm breaking up. Here we go now. Hey, you got that? Round one, the naval blockade. Round two, the Battle of Mackinac Island. Round three, the Battle of Fort Detroit. Round four, Battle of Fort Dearborn. Round five, Mohawks join the British. Round six, the Battle of Queenston Heights. Brock's down, he's killed, but his spirit lives on. Round seven, the capture of York. Round eight, the Battle of Stony Creek. Round nine, the Battle of Beaver Dams. Round 10, the Battle of Chrysler's Farm. Round 11, the Battle of the Shannon and the Chesapeake. Round 12, the Battle of Fort Erie. Round 13, the Battle of Lundy's Lane. Round 14, the Burning of Washington. And round 15, the Battle of New Orleans. The Americans kept losing battles, but they won the war. Kind of the opposite of Vietnam, where they won all the major battles and lost the war. Now, the peace treaty guarantees America's right to exist and land, lots of land, just not this land. This is Discovery Harbor in Penetanguishene, Ontario, a beautifully restored British military establishment. Built for the War of 1812, it was maintained for long afterwards because Canadian colonists were afraid of an independent America but some were inspired by American independence. As America grew, expanding westward, Canadians began to think that maybe life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, or something milder and more suitable for the cold weather, would be a good idea. So some frustrated rebels in Lower Canada started the Lower Canada Rebellion. When that didn't work out, came the Upper Canada Rebellion. And when that didn't work out, came more talk. The instigators of the rebellions, Papineau and Mackenzie, fled to the United States. Both men eventually returned to Canada and were pardoned. But their rabble-rousing did cause Britain to sit up and take notice. London sends Lord Durham, who quickly concludes the colony should be confederated. <laughs> Upper Canada, Lower Canada, Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, and PEI, 
begin tiptoeing towards union, like the United States. Even the British want the colonies to unite, like the United States. Meanwhile, the United States have become ununited. North versus South. The American Civil War leads to mass slaughter, an entertaining Ken Burns documentary, and Canadian Confederation under Sir John A. Macdonald. If we learn only one thing from the American Civil War, it's that we need a strong central government to overrule the petty local interests. In this way, we can build a strong nation that can endure. Only then can we enjoy the intoxicating nectar of freedom. Only then will we enjoy the cold, refreshing taste of self-rule. Dignity on the rocks! Imagine Canada like, like an ice cube floating in a glass of whiskey. Some people say she's half full. I say she's half empty. I say we need a refill. Who's with me? Pub's open. All right, man. Another way the Civil War caused Canada to be was the Alabama, and not the state, the warship. These are the adventures of the Confederate ship Alabama, whose five-year mission to seek out Union ships and sink them, to disrupt trade and capture supplies, to cause millions of dollars in damage to the Northern military. What's going on? Uh, you didn't specify what kind of ships wreck. So you got spaceships? Yeah, a friend lent them to me. Sailing ships are really hard to build, man. Disrupt trade, capture supplies. Look, I know the network doesn't care, but could we get something a little more historically accurate? Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, whatever, Rick. To boldly sink northern warships, to board enemy vessels, and... Thank you. The point is, the British-built Alabama sank a lot of ships and raised a lot of hackles. Americans blamed the British for extending the Civil War. Canada, you're next. Let's punish British North America. Up yours, Canada. Lower Canada should be up for Vermont. But Her Majesty wasn't about to hand over half a continent to anyone. Bad precedent and all that, what, what, yes. So instead, London pushes the Canadian colonies to get their British North America act together. Nova Scotia's economy is booming. The other colonies just want our wealth. I don't like the way they're pushing this on New Brunswick and calling a snap election. It stinks. You ask me? This is another trick by the English to assimilate our culture. The British run the greatest empire the world has ever known. Why would Upper Canada want to leave it? The Civil War ups the pressure for Confederation in other ways, because when peace erupts, the USA is left with a lot of heavily armed guys and no one to attack. Meet the fighting, feuding, freaking Fenians. And we've learned the only way to win freedom is violence. What about talking? Talking? What do you think I'm doing? Talking about violence? Right, now, Canada is easy pickings. I say we invade, hold them colonies hostage until bloody Britain frees our beloved Ireland. And then we return to these United States and from here return to Ireland. Who thinks I'm talking sense? Well, who's with me anyway? Will this be Canada then? We've come to attack British land! Yeah. Oh, oh no, this is uh, Alabama! New Brunswick is that way! All right, boys, let's go. Let's go. So Irishmen from America attack Nova Scotia to get at the British and that helps create Canada. Well, fear of Americans has kept Canada together ever since. Coming up, another way the Civil War saves America and creates Canada. In the 1860s, hard-drinking General Ulysses S. Grant fights the Civil War to keep America together. Meanwhile, hard-drinking Johnny MacDonald works to put Canada together. And what tool do they both rely on? Well, nations have always formed along rivers, the Nile, the Thames, the Yangtze. For Canada, it's the St. Lawrence River. This is our lifeline of trade, and the economy moves at the speed of a paddle until the railways trains were fast, and fast railways had been a key to the North's victory over the Confederates. Canada took note. As well, it's easier to lay track than dig canals, and ships had one more drawback. And now to weather. 
As you can see, old man winter has finally settled in, rivers and lakes are frozen solid, and the schools are closed. The government is closed, the factories are closed, grist mills are closed, forges are closed, roads are closed, and the taverns are open! <laughs> Now, British Columbia was considering joining Confederation if she could get a road built across the prairies. When Ottawa offered a railway, BC said, OK. And PEI had an IOU on its trains. So an offer from Ottawa to pay off the Islanders' railway debt was a key factor in their decision to join Confederation. <laughs> Macdonald becomes Prime Minister and oversees the start of the Canadian Pacific Railway. Grant oversees the Union Pacific Railroad, then becomes President of the United States. The railroad will ensure our presence in the West. The railway will keep the Americans out of our West. Our nation will be joined by a ribbon of steel. Our nation will also be bound by a ribbon of steel. Oh, is that so? All right, then we'll have two ribbons of steel, one for each wheel. Ours, too. Our railroad will be paid for with good old American cash. Ours, too. Two nations Ours built too. by and around railways. Unlike the American railway, the CPR was derailed again and again until one man made it happen. We are the Métis, proud of our French heritage, proud of our native heritage, and angry about our treatment. The Hudson Bay Company has sold our land to Canada, and those of us who live here were included in the bargain. Did you ask to be sold? Did we ask those anti-Catholic Easterners to come here and push us around? No! no! We are a new nation. If Canada wants us to join, they're going to have to talk to me. Yeah. Bullocks. Oh, I did it, huh? I forced Ottawa to give us Catholic school and to recognize the French language. The government of Canada agreed. Yeah. Cool. I guess someone forgot to tell the army, huh? And so, as the leader of a British North America Rebellion, I guess I got to do what all great leaders like Papineau and Mackenzie do, eh? I flee to the States! Hey. I'm a pack! I've been to America and an asylum, and now I know my destiny. We have God on our side! We have the railway and a machine gun on our side. God is the key to our defense. Nothing can harm me now. I am sending in the troops by rail to really derail Riel's unruly rally. I am Louis David Riel, the prophet of the new world, infallible pontiff and priest king. <laughs> Save us, Lord! Protect us! <laughs> Give us a miracle! There is no miracle. MacDonald lets Riel hang. His voice is silenced. I believe that this will prove that the railroad is not some make-work project to make some rich men richer. The people of Canada owe a debt to the railway. And the owners of the railway, they owe a debt to Louis Riel. Suddenly the railway was seen as a strategic weapon. Iron rails could bind the nation together and tell everyone, we're here. Trains bring settlers to the west, north and south of the 49th parallel. But what a difference between the American Wild West and the Canadian Mild West. That's in large part due to Sir John A. Macdonald's creation, the Mounties. The Mounties don't carry guns, and they don't need to. Drop it! Okay. <laughs> the Mounties chase American whiskey traders back across the border. 20 years later... American entrepreneurs come north seeking something more desirable than booze. Women! <laughs> no gold. 30 years after California's wild gold rush, someone hits pay dirt in the Yukon. And unlike the California gold rush, the Yukon is almost civilized. How Canadian, a gold rush with a lineup. Purpose of your visit? Gold, gold. Are you importing any fruits or meats? Yeah. Good, you need them to prevent scurvy. Any knives or sharp instruments? Yeah. Good, you need them for hunting. Any firearms? Yeah. Good, you'll need them to hunt meat. Any explosives? 
for dynamite. Oh, good. You need that to mine gold. Do you have anything else to declare? Yeah, I declare myself pretty pissed off at all this paperwork. Out of my way, monkey boy. Hey, you know, I could ask you to bend over, and I am wearing cloth gloves. Next. Then in the 20th century, things get kind of wonky. Two nations, which have more and more in common, have leaders who are farther and farther apart. Starting with tough-talking Teddy Roosevelt and suave Wilfred Laurier. The 19th century was the century of the United States. I think we can claim it is Canada that shall fill the 20th century. Bully, the 20th century will belong to anyone who talks softly and carries a big stick. <laughs> Goodbye, Guatemala! <laughs> yes, okay, we have some differences with our friends to the south, but we do share a common interest. Reciprocity or free trade. The Liberal Party will be running on a platform of free trade. So two very different leaders fall to defeat, but their nations stand together in victory. How? In the 18th and 19th century, Canadians and Americans fought with each other. In the 20th century, they fought with each other. World War I, 12 nations, millions killed, chemical warfare, air war, new weapons, and leading their nations in the stupendous and stupid conflict are the one match set of the 20th century, Wooden Woodrow Wilson and boring Robert Borden. Tea, Woody. Mm, yes, thank you, Bob. This war is awful. Yes. Well, I stayed out as long as I could. Smart. 18 million killed. Mm. Appalling. Still, Bob, you did manage to forge a nation. Mm. As the Civil War forged America. Mm, yes. Mm. Now your troops have the Hun on the run. Victory after victory for over 100 days. What are you calling it? The Hundred Days. Yes. Appropriate. The war was depressing. Then came the Depression. And our nations turned to Franklin Delano Roosevelt and Richard Bennett, the genteel intellectual and the pompous millionaire. One talks the talk, one walks the walk. We've had four years of misery. Americans need a new deal. Smarten up, you lazy plebeians. <laughs> Our Social Security Acts will assist the aged, the unemployed, and the crippled. I made my millions. Why can't you? We're going to restore our farms through the Agricultural Adjustment Act. A little hunger builds character. We are creating thousands of jobs through the Tennessee Valley Authority. The government is not a charity. And a farm credit administration and a farm security administration. Recovery is just around the corner. My National Recovery Act will revive industry. I meant the next corner. The Hatch Act will streamline government. You know, corners build character. Building interstate highways will create thousands of jobs. But eventually, Bennett has to face the plebeians. An election already. Well, I think it's time we had a new deal as well. Uh, it's a deathbed conversion because Bennett is killed at the polls by another sexy bachelor, William Lyon Mackenzie King, great-grandson of William Lyon Mackenzie. Stay tuned for A Man of the World and The Afterworld. Do -do 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 -do. <laughs> By the end of the Dirty Thirties, both Canada and the USA have their longest serving leaders, Franklin Delano Roosevelt and Mackenzie King. Devastated by the Depression, both Canada and the United States need something to get their economies booming. Oh, a war. Canada becomes the arsenal of democracy, and the United States becomes an even bigger arsenal of democracy. Roosevelt leads by speeches and personality. King by being bland and avoiding decisions. King waffles and sidesteps for five years to avoid bringing in conscription, which has divided French and English Canadians. In America, Roosevelt simply brings in the draft. After the war, the 20th century trend of opposite styles continues. 
In Ottawa, elegant bilingual Louis Saint Laurent. In Washington, honest, plain-spoken Harry Truman. We will build a strong Canada through government mega-projects. The Trans-Canada Highway, the Trans-Canada Airlines, and the Trans-Canada Pipeline. We'll keep America strong, America, by stationing troops all over the world. We will build international bonds at the United Nations, in the United States. We will build intercontinental missiles in the Midwest, near Canada. The UN is supposed to be the world's policeman. Why do we need that? Well, consider, if you kill someone from another street, another neighborhood, another city, even another province, the police catch you, you go to jail. But if you kill someone from another country, they give you a medal, huh? Qu'est-ce qu'il a dit? Je sais quoi. The UN had a charter to find a better way, and soon the charter had its first big test. Communist North Korea invades somewhat democratic South Korea. The UN condemns the invasion. The invasion continues. So the UN sends in troops from Australia, Belgium, Britain, Canada, Colombia, Ethiopia, France, Greece, Luxembourg, the Netherlands, New Zealand, the Philippines, Thailand, and Turkey. And a whole bunch of Americans led by General Douglas MacArthur. Of course, this was back when the United States was still willing to get United Nations approval. And then comes a pair everyone approves of. Rich playboy Kennedy, humble prairie lawyer Diefenbaker. The first lady is a hot tomato, while the PM's wife is a dry olive. That's the myth. Everyone remembers President Kennedy as the charismatic leader, but John Diefenbaker was actually the hotter star. Believe it or not, his campaign speeches got the same reaction as another 50 celebrity. Forget Elvis the pelvis, it's Deef the chief. Oh, Canada, you mind from sea to sea. Oh, Canada, you true, no strong and free. I will be your destiny, if only you will for me, oh, then I'll have the power to crush my enemy. Booga booga bing bong, walla walla boo, Okanagan near galoop de loop de loop. When a polyfrost says a mess of all the vowels, I blame it on the Macron and I blame it on my jowls. I'm fairly incoherent when I'm a speaker French. But when I speak the English, I don't make much more sense. Booga booga bing bong, walla walla boo. Only Diefenbaker could turn this adoration into aggravation. An example of how Dief ticked everyone off? We are a nation of the North, so I have taken action. I have made a decision to switch 15% of Canada's trade with the United States, which is to the South, to Britain, which is to the North. Where are you to go over the poor? We are concerned by Mr. Diefenbaker's unprecedented decision, as it is contrary to the rules of the General Agreement on Trade, the rules of economics, and everything that is fair and decent in the universe! So Dief is forced to go back on his word. We understand Mr. Diefenbaker has reversed his promise and will not be transferring trade to Britain, and we are more than a little disappointed. And surprised. And hurt. We could use the money. <laughs> Diefenbaker didn't like Yankees, and he ticked them off. Diefenbaker loved Brits, and he ticked them off. Then he began to tick off Canadians. Deep puts the shaft to the arrow. The fabulous fighter is over budget and off the rails. The Avro Arrow is a first rate, Canadian made, world class fighter aircraft. And as Canada has a long and a proud tradition of providing its military with lousy foreign-made equipment, well, I'm canceling the project. The brain drain begins. Well, I think hundreds of Canadian scientists and engineers will have to move to the United States to get work on their space program, which is a crying shame when you consider how little the American dollar is worth. The future is in missiles. Missiles that will point to the North, for we are a country of the North. Where will we get the missiles? From the South. We will be buying the Bomark American Missile System. And believe you me, it is a unique missile system. Washington explains why the missiles are unique. Yes, uh, no one else will buy the Bomark. Thanks, Canada. We can't supply you with the nuclear warheads. 
Yes, well, as you know, Canada has declared itself a, uh, a nuclear-free zone. And so we will be using um, alternative warheads. And in Ottawa... The missiles will be armed with a particulate matter, a granular payload of multiple fragmentary shards of sand. Sand? Sand. The Canadian military has a great deal of experience with sand in sandbags, but the missile will be as deadly as an arrow. The Avro Arrow Fighter? No, uh, a real arrow. Oh, oh, God. God. The sand will come from a Canadian beach. While Diefenbaker flounders, Kennedy hits all the right notes. Girl, I've got a question, I know you do too. But ask not what this land can do for you. I'm looking for courageous heroes to lead this nation to greatness through actions and deeds. So girl, I promise we'll go to the stars. And I've been in battles, I've had it with wars. Let's conquer the world with my new peace corps. Then get naked at my place and roll around on the floor. Then the Cold War takes a vacation from Europe to sunny Cuba, and things get hot, hot, hot. <laughs> 1962, the Cuban Missile Crisis, a no-win Mexican standoff between Kennedy, Khrushchev, and Castro. America's allies answer the call to arms, with one notable exception. Put down your missiles! Never! You get your missiles out of Turkey, or I'll shoot! Oh, there'll be a Turkey shoot, all right, and I mean it! Oh, we have you outnumbered! Mr. Blue! Mr. Blue! Yes, yes, what is it? Mr. Blue's on my side, aren't you, Mr. Blue? Ah, uh, yes. Well, I haven't actually come to a conclusion about that, Johnny. Don't you mess with me, Dave and Baker. These guys have missiles. Oh, yes. Well, I've got missiles, too. I've got bulwarks. <laughs> <laughs> yes, our missiles have atomic warheads, not sandbags. And right here in little old Cuba. Ah, yes, Cuba. Land to the south. Oh, but Canada's a land to the north. A man knows where he stands in Canada. He stands to the north! Deef sends all the wrong signals. He had been a terrific lawyer, a guardian of the little guy. But when he became Deef the chief... He goes a little woo-woo. Deef grows increasingly paranoid that everyone is out to get him. And eventually, everyone is. The Tories drop back to where Deef is best, in opposition. The new Prime Minister, Lester B. Pearson, makes peace with John Kennedy. What up with that? But someone really was out to get JFK, and he's killed. By the mid-60s, relations between Canada and the United States improve. Relations between the President and Prime Minister get worse. Meet LBJ and LBP. They couldn't have been more different if one had been a loud, profane American and the other a quiet, conciliatory Canadian. Johnson talks the talk, Pearson walks the walk. I promise to build a great society. And flatten North Vietnam society. I'm creating the Canadian Pension Plan, free Medicare, and abolishing capital punishment. We'll win the war and kill them commies. Land a man on the moon. Kill any commies there, too. We will support the UN's peacekeeping missions whenever and wherever they are sent. And to ensure no one assumes we've come to start trouble, we'll send our boys in with really rotten equipment. This is Prime Minister Lester B. Pearson. We now return you to Foster Hewitt and Hockey Night in Canada. Moving from questions of global war to the important question of who's got a job, trade booms. In fact, we're still America's biggest trading partner. Gentlemen, I want to know how we can sell more GM cars up in Canada. Design brakes that don't cost kids, design a better suspension price erodes, install more expensive winter tires, install a more expensive better battery, install a block heater, and design a window defroster that actually defrosts the window. Johnny! Why don't we just give the American cars Canadian names? I like it. Uh, like the Pontiac Puck. Uh -huh. The Chevy Chinook. Good. Oh, uh, the Diefenbuick. And the Laurentian. Huh? The Acadian. The Newfinator. The Cadillac. The Zamboni. I love it. 
okay, okay, the cars aren't Canadian, but more and more the parts are. Under Pearson, we signed the Auto Pact with the United States. The Auto Pact creates wealth and proves that free trade works, leading to no other free trade. By the late 60s, the contrast gets even stronger. A Quaker Dick and a French Peter. Americans go back to Richard Nixon from the 50s. Canadians kind of get ahead of themselves with Pierre Trudeau, who isn't even 50. What do you think about your enemies? Oh, well, uh, I know they hate me. Uh, I have lists of enemies, and uh, I'll deal with them. I am the president. Uh, I will be respected. What do you think about your enemies? Oh, screw them. What is the greatest threat to the future of the country? Oh, uh, communism. Uh, separatism. Are you worried that more and more countries will become communist? Oh, uh, yes, it's the uh, domino theory. As goes Angola, uh, so goes Alabama. Communism is a cancer to our democratic way of life, second only to uh, uh, Watergate. Well, uh, if there are more countries going communist, uh, there are more countries that need our wheat. Uh, China must be brought into the civilized world, and these communists must be brought to heel. I love going to China. Now, is it true you called Canadian Prime Minister Trudeau an asshole? Oh, uh, I never said that. I'm a Quaker. Uh, I don't use expletive deletus. Well, uh, I've, I've been called worse by better people, uh, my ex-wife for one. What about Trudeau-mania? Trudeau-mania, this is uh, something that's been invented by the press. Uh, Nixon-mania, uh, I'm not really sure what that is. <coughs> what about the loneliness of office? Oh, uh, I'm never lonely. I have, uh, I have my dog checkers. Oh, yes, and uh, Pat. What about the loneliness of office? Well, uh, yes, the loneliness of office, but also later at night in bed, it is very lonely as well. Perhaps uh, you could help me out with that. Ah, the 60s. While Americans burned their flag, we replaced ours. Ta-da! Most Americans are kind of surprised to find out that while their campuses and ghettos exploded with gunfire, our mailboxes exploded with terrorist bombs. The FLQ and the October Crisis bring Canada to the brink of civil war. Or so it seems at the time. It's time we quit blowing up mailboxes and do something bigger. Huh? Mail trucks? No. Oh. First, we kidnap someone. Then, we kidnap someone else. Then. We screw it up. We kill one of the hostages. We turn everyone in the country against us. <laughs> we alienate everyone. Then we botch it. We flee to Cuba in a jet and we spend a couple of sunny years there until we realize that communism is just a big piece of poo. Then we come back, we spend a couple of years in jail, and then we get soft government jobs. <laughs> eh? well, good plan. Good, good plan. plan. I will go and phone in the ransom demand. Oh, no, 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 no. They can trace their phone. Use their post. I cannot. We have blown up the mailboxes. All right, ladies and gentlemen, coming up, we'll see when Canada and the United States finally had leaders who saw eye to eye when Irish eyes are watching. Follow me. Stay with the group. After Richard Nixon and Pierre Trudeau came Gerald Ford, John Turner, and Joe Clark. It was tough to listen to what they had to say. Nixon spent his retirement trying to clean up his image and ensure his legacy. Trudeau came out of retirement to ensure his. And that leads to our next peculiar pairing. An actor who acts like a leader and a leader who leads like an actor. Both are real good on camera, and both have fiscal policies a child could understand. Inflation is bad, and so I'm going to deal with nasty old inflation with wage and price controls. Mr. 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 Trudeau, Mr. Trudeau, um, I thought you opposed them. Yeah, yeah didn't, you, didn't you campaign against them? Well, uh, that was then, this is now. Uh, we have to look forward, we have to move ahead. Well, hi, boys and girls. I'm Ronald. Hello, Ronald. 
My idea is Reaganomics. What? Since the people who make most of the money pay most of the taxes, I'm going to cut taxes on the rich. That way, they'll be able to buy more yachts and diamond rings, which will in turn create uh, more jobs for the ordinary yacht builders and uh, jewelers. And that's why I've set up the Foreign Investment Review Agency. Won't that stop investment and slow down economic growth? Uh, government rules are slowing down the economy. That's impossible. Uh, yeah, but don't the rich just invest extra income? Yeah. Uh, no. Won't, won't they send that money offshore? Well, uh... Don't the poor people spend every dollar they have? Keeping their money in circulation? Well, that's... Yeah, pe people yeah. on welfare put every penny back into the economy. Yeah. <laughs> well, now you're not thinking like millionaires. Besides, I've set up the National Energy Program to freeze the price of oil. Well, what if oil prices go down? Yeah. yeah. Oh, won't that tick off Alberta? Yeah, <laughs> but it's, uh, it's only Alberta. <laughs> this is my trickle-down theory. Have you ever been trickled on? Then, suddenly, it's 1984! With Brian Mulroney and Ronald Reagan, Canada and the United States finally have leaders who think alike. They believe government is bad, inefficient, wasteful. Being in government, they ought to know. Mulroney's campaign promise? We will manage government finances with a sharp eye <laughs> and build a more united Canada. <laughs> Nine years later? Uh, the nation is far more in debt and uh, separatism is a major force again. Uh, goodbye. <laughs> Brian Mulroney promises give us 20 years and you won't recognize this country. We give him nine years and I do recognize this country. It's America. <laughs> Angry over the GST and free trade, Canadians turn to a man who offers change. <clears throat> Cray Chen's campaign promise? If elected, the Liberal Party promises to remove the GST and to pull out of free trade. Three months later... What about free trade and the GST? As trade in goods and services booms, we begin to toy with other American ideas like private health care, political assassination. Jean Chrétien faces several threats. Well, not threats so much, but attempts. Save him! Save him! Protect him! Get the Prime Minister off that guy! A man managed to slip past the two elderly security guards, the picket fence, and the littlest hobo attack dogs. The Prime Minister grabbed an Inuit sculpture to bash the burglar, while his wife Aileen, who does not know karate, but has a black belt to match her black shoes, locked the intruder out. The RCMP is promised to upgrade security. Let me introduce you to the one piece of equipment that could save your life! The door lock! When used properly, it can stop any intruder or even the world's greatest police force, the RCMP. Take it. Sleep with it. It is your mother. It is your lover. Do Speaking you of doorknobs brings us to another unlikely pair, Bill Clinton and Jean Chrétien. Bill Clinton was a Rhodes Scholar, a great negotiator and the master of compromise. And he was often in compromising positions. Jean Chrétien was tough, single-minded, and pretty hard on his critics. I was not. I'm nice. I'm the little guy from Shoeing Again. Both men had partners they fought with and publicly humiliated. Hillary, I did not have sex with that woman. My cigar did. Oh, baby, you have to smile for the press and, and, and pretend it's OK. Remember, you want to be a senator. Paul, I did not screw with the sponsorship money. My aides did it for me. Oh. You have to smile for the press and pretend it's OK. Remember, you don't want to end up a senator. At least Bill and Hillary make up. She becomes a senator from New York, and Paul Martin becomes prime minister of Canada, so roughly equal in prestige. And Paul Martin becomes half of our final gruesome twosome with George Bush Jr. Read my lips. No new terrorists. We, uh, we don't know, and uh, we will find out, because that's what Canadians want, uh, is finding out about stuff. I'm a dog and simple-minded. Ah, oh, wait, wait a second. <laughs> I mean, I'm dogged and single-minded. Man, I hate when I do that. Why do I do that? 
We will lead by consensus unless enough people don't want us to. Then we won't. We will bring democracy to the world. That's democracy with them voting machines with the hanging chads. <laughs> We've been given the authority of a minority by a majority of Canadians. I'm not ashamed of my military record during the war in Vietnam. Uh, what's there to be ashamed of? <laughs> Thanks, Daddy. Canadians want change, and we will continue to give them the same old change that they're used to. We will fight these terrorists from Saudi Arabia by invading Iraq. So now Paul and George just need a John and a Ringo, and the world's longest undefended border is again being closely watched, this time from the south. Well, that's a refreshing change. Them nervous of us. Now, it's been said that there's no difference between Americans and Canadians, and that the quickest way to prove that wrong is to say exactly that to a Canadian. Because there are differences, starting at the top. Like, the greatest American presidents have always demonstrated strong leadership. The most successful prime ministers have always demonstrated good people skills and management skills and, well, Trudeau accepted. And as for Americans not in the White House, well, I happen to think that Yanks are among the greatest people in the world, especially when they come here. Step away from the fence. Step away from the 